Say, I want to make an effective argument against a launch system. How should I go about that? Depends. I would focus on uh, technical viability. I'd look at you know, the depth of the trade studies and maybe look at some historical designs for faults. Gotcha. Okay, so if Lehman's explanation, botch the big problem, play a video game instead of making spreadsheets doing you know, trade studies, and then get the history completely wrong. No. Oh. No, no! Five, four, three, two, Morning everyone, I'm the pressure-fed astronaut, here to take on space cadets, space flight, and occasionally a conspiracy theorist. I hope that's a better intro. Today, we're looking at everyday astronauts, why SSTOs suck. Why are we looking at this? Well, the answer is simple. He's wrong about a lot, but the layman, his target audience, might not catch his flawed argumentation. For this response, I'm going to kind of hack apart Everyday Astronaut's video for time and cohesion for our arguments. Everyday Astronaut does talk about a few ideas and concepts relatively well here, so I'm not going to waste my time with those. Why would I make a video about him being right? This is the internet. Everyone's wrong but me. Oh, and for uh, transparency and openness, I should note my two big biases here. Uh, the first is that I'm a big dumb booster guy. Why well, have one stage and have three? And the second is that I don't really think much of Mr. Astronaut. His videos are passable surface level analyses of certain spaceflight concepts, but more recently he's clearly fallen into the Elon Musk fandom, which taints his newer videos to the point where I just can't take him seriously anymore. The real problem here is that there is a natural extent of a layman understanding of things, and he's finally reached it, but doesn't know it. Oh, and he uses his own music in his videos. Uh, I'm, I'm not a new music critic, I never will be, but I mean, if you really feel the need to comment on it, feel free. Just, you know, don't, don't sue me. So let's look at the pros and cons of SSTO. Imagine a world where a launch vehicle takes off, goes to space, comes back, refuels, and does that multiple times a day. No problem. Sounds like a real-life Millennium Falcon. I too have seen Star Trek. Starting off with science fiction is always a good idea for your arguments. Just list your pros and get on with it. Sounds great, right? One vehicle to do it all. Nice and simple. Just like a jetliner at an airport. And okay, so uh, that's it from him. So what are mine? Actually, they're roughly the same. A fully reusable SSTO, assuming you could make one, would offer simplified operations. Airline-like operations are a lot easier to handle if you only have one vehicle to, you know, recover, refurbish, and then reuse. Another is launch sites. A re fully reusable SSTO could theoretically launch from anywhere because it has no staging events. Why? What's the point? The only thing they claim that's an advantage is they can launch inland because there are no spent stages to fall on populated areas. Uh... Everyday Astronaut disagrees without substantiation. He does that a lot, by the way. Airline-like operations are a lot easier for on your SSTO if you could launch from inland sites. I mean, until you start looking at the FAA regulations and... <laughs> Another benefit is in-space reuse. If you can refuel your SSTO on orbit, you could toss its payloads to pretty much anywhere in the solar system. Seriously. This brings us to the cons. What are the arguments against SSTO, everyday astronaut? It was revolutionary and pivotal in putting something of any significance into orbit. Staging is the number one cure for the tyranny of the rocket equation. 
He also talks about refurbishment issues because it's coming in through reentry heating. You know, it says, oh, that's an operational issue. But then he also talks about Starship, which would also have the same issues. Nope, my cons are roughly the same. Structural and propulsion limits, a big old dollar sign, operations, we'll get into that, and then development issues. Which, coincidentally, also rhyme with the tyranny of the rocket equation. So what's that? This is the rocket equation that oppresses us all. Delta V equals ISP times G times natural log of R. Now, for those of us who are not rocket inclined, this is all Greek, you know, because it's a delta. But I can equate this to something else that's more palatable to you, your car. All right, see, I've drawn this. Right, so your distance equals your miles per gallon times gallons, right? So for like my car, my car has 32 miles per gallon and can hold 15 or 16 gallons of gas, which means on one tank, I can go about 500 miles. This is a lot like the rocket equation, where a rocket's MPGs is ISP times G, and the gallons is R. R is the ratio of the wet mass over the dry mass of your rocket. So wet mass is when you're full of propellant, dry mass is when, well, you've burned. And for my car, I go in distance, but for rockets, it's delta V, which is change in velocity, because velocity is kind of a big thing with orbital mechanics. So the tyranny of our rocket equation comes from pretty much these numbers, right? We're going back to my car as the example. My hometown is 950 miles away from here, which means I'd need to refuel my car at least once along the way. With rockets, the delta V needed to get to low Earth orbit from the surface, you need about 9.3 kilometers a second. Now you'll see numbers that go for as low as 9.12, others go up to 9.5, but a good rough number we'll be using is 9.3, right? So if that's set for our SSTO, we need to figure out R and ISP. R is determined by the structures of your rocket, you know, the sizing, the scaling, how it's all put together. ISP is determined by your propellant and your engine configurations, right? So for example, the Saturn V's first stage was powered by the F1 engine, which has a vacuum ISP of about 304 seconds. ISP is measured in seconds, of course. Whereas the RS-25, the SSME of the space shuttle and SLS, uh, has this vacuum specific impulse of 452 seconds. So we know delta V and ISP, we need to find R. Now, just as we're noting here, some of us rocket engineers are already going, ah, but that's a vacuum. When you're on the surface of the earth, you're not in a vacuum, you're in the atmosphere. Your atmospheric performance changes as you go higher, right? So the number I use and I've seen used is we use 95% of the vacuum specific impulse for calculating R. So for our two SSTOs that we're looking at right now as a quick example, for the F1 powered SSTO, the R has to be 26.65. So the SSTO fully fueled has to weigh 26.65 times as much as, much as it does weigh empty. Okay. For the SSME powered SSTO, with all the S's involved, has an R of 9.1. But what is R? What is a reasonable R to have? R can be broken down into your payload mass, your propellant mass, and your structural mass of the rocket. While payload capacity is, of course, the, the big thing with your vehicle, what we're going to be looking at right now is your structural mass. Now your structural mass is tanks, engines, uh, you know, wiring, cables, you know, decals, and in turn, whatever, whatever else you have inside your rocket. Now you can determine structural mass as a percentage of your propellant mass. Now there are plenty of papers that talk about this, uh, but we're not going to look into those. Side note, the next video, the design video, is going to go more into the actual math for these ideas, as long as the estimations and calculations we'll be using. Let's say our structural mass is 10% that of the propellant mass. So for a stage that can carry 100 metric tons of propellant, the stage itself weighs 10 metric tons, leading to a total mass of 110 metric tons, plus whatever the payload is. 
So if our SSTO had to carry 20 metric tons to low Earth orbit, that's a good round number, right? An F1 powered SSME would require minus 328 metric tons of propellant. Uh-oh. Uh, uh but an SSME powered SSTO with all of its S's included would need 853 metric tons of propellant. Now, a comparable launch vehicle, the Falcon 9, weighs 506 metric tons at liftoff. Yeah. Everyday astronaut uses Kerbal Space Program to explain this. Badly. He fumbles around, fails, and then assures us he's right. There's no discussion of you know, the structural issues, the propulsion issues, propellants, none of that. And this is how you can tell he's not an engineer, by the way. If you really want to convey this a lot more effectively, use spreadsheets and charts. Propulsion-wise, getting better engine performance requires variable area altitude compensating nozzles like an aero spike or just highly efficient engines, you know, like high pressure. Structurally, to get your weights down you know, low enough and still have the same strengths, you'll need specialized alloys. We'll go deeper in the design video. Those engines and structures aren't going to be cheap either. You also have to factor in that the real rocket, the one you actually build, not the paper version, is likely going to see a weight growth of about up to 20%, which is going to be catastrophic depending on your vehicle. Now, of course, once you actually build the thing, you can probably shave off weight in a certain few spots, but how much could you realistically do? And our SSTO is limited to LEO. You're squeezing a lot of performance out of your engines and materials to get into a low Earth orbit. Unless you build a, an infrastructure you know, with tugs or something like what the Aquarius launcher had, you're stuck in low Earth orbit. Adding this up doesn't paint a very pretty picture for SSTO. Talking about reusable SSTOs, most people in concepts utilize a space plane design, a vehicle which takes off and lands like a plane. Here's my hot take. Winged SSTOs aren't practical. You see, unless this is a monocoque lifting body like X-33 or Venture Star, those wings are just dead weight. A uh, useless dead weight past a certain altitude. Plus, control surfaces need actuators and you know, other hardware to be useful, which, guess what, adds more dead weight. Your mass margins are thin enough on an SSTO already. Those aren't helping. The same applies to air-breathing engines, too. Those are overly complex systems for a relatively short part of your flight. So why don't you just build a better engine and slightly bigger propellant tanks? I'd wager those are cheaper and lighter weight than a scramjet. What about real designs? Maybe those guys cracked a few of the problems already. Here. Let's take a look at some SSTO designs past, present, and future to see if there's anything that seems promising. Let's start off with some previously proposed and pursued SSTOs and look at why they failed. Oh, great! Well, one of the earliest proposals was the One Stage Orbital Space Truck, or OOST, by Phil Bono of Douglas Space in the 1960s. Ah, uh, yes. Oost. That's Ithacus, by the way, and Phil Bono didn't design the first SSTOs. The first came in 1946 with the Navy's HATV program. With that, the North American Aviation design was the first, and it utilized balloon tanks. It was the first design to actually do that. So no, Carl Bossart, the one true god, was not the first to do it. He later used it. Though, the HATV program didn't really go anywhere, and the Air Force stifled it. Then we get to the Bono SSTOs, which Everyday Astronaut only talks about Oost. There's also Rhombus, Pegasus, Ithacus, Hyperion, and SASSTO. Though some did use drop tanks, so they're cheating. SASSTO is to be a modified S4B stage because the S4B had a very low dry mass. Uh, you just strap on an aero spike, modify some of the structural components, and theoretically it could have gone to orbit on its own and even been reusable. Though, that might not actually been possible. 
Another proposal from the 60s was the Nexus rocket, which would have been freaking huge. I'm talking insanely big. It would have been 122 meters or 400 feet tall with a width of 50 meters or 164 feet. Holy moly. Nexus was a big one, and there were two. Okay, so paper rockets are one thing, but how about a rocket that was actually being tested? Look no further than the DCX or Delta Clipper Experimental made by McDonnell Douglas. He forgot a lot. He also forgot some of the Nova designs from the 60s for the post-Apollo era. Now these would have been really big boosters. Okay, some were, some were stage and a half, but there were plenty of SSTOs in there. Now we're talking about big boosters here, you know, a million pounds to low Earth orbit big, which does actually lead us to the king of these designs, the Boeing MLLV. Without boosters, it was gonna carry one million pounds to Leo. With boosters and an upper stage, 3.5 million. With some studies hinting at an upper limit of nearly 5 million pounds. Yeah. What those payloads were going to be, I have no idea. But that was definitely one of the biggest designs I've found. Another Boeing design was the Big Onion, also misnamed as LEO. Now back in the 70s, there were proposals for massive solar power satellites to alleviate our energy needs. Since these solar power satellites were enormous, they'd need big launchers to carry up their materials. Big Onion was going to carry 227 metric tons to LEO, uh, riding up on 48 engines and launching from a man-made lake where it would also land. There's also Star Raker, uh, Scott Manley talked about that one. Then you got you know, Hotal, Vita Hall, Millennium Express, the German Beta series, you got Canco Maru, you got a bunch of other paper rockets. Now during the 80s, two big SSTO proponent names did emerge. You have uh, Gary Hudson and Maxwell Hunter. Hudson formed Pacific American Launch Systems in the 1980s to build his Phoenix series of SSTOs. You can actually find reference to them in this book. And these designs had some really interesting performance metrics and flight cost numbers. In the late 1980s, I can find reference to another SSTO he proposed called Liberty X. Now, that paper only talks about it being used as a commercial uh, launcher for resupply missions to Space Station Freedom and pretty much nowhere else. Gary Hudson's last SSTO comes after the DCX program, which Maxwell Hunter did work on. The DCX was an actual working one-third scale prototype of a proposed DCY SSTO that was to be capable of putting about 1,300 kilograms or 3,000 pounds into orbit. The D no. DCY was a larger version of DCX. Delta Clipper was to be the real operational SSTO, and that had a payload of nine metric tons. I have no idea where you got your numbers. Next, how about maybe the craziest proposed SSTO of all time, the Roton. This thing is hilarious. This is a helicopter that could get to orbit, supposedly. You, you got the old design. The original version looked like this. Rotary Rocket is an interesting company to read into, especially for their failure. Sure, a lack of funding and interest in the idea, combined with the fact that the atmospheric test vehicle was nearly impossible to fly, did kill the company, but what really killed it was a collapse of the proposed MEO market. So you're talking about Iridium, Global Star, Navistar, and one or two other uh, proposed large constellations. And then there's the X-33 and Venture Star, which he does cover adequately. Darn you, wait. Adequately. Then there's Skylon, which is a neat development, but Jeff Bell did have some really mean words to say about it. Uh, feel free to read his critique of SSTOs. There's the Haas 2C, which Everyday Astronaut rightfully dismisses for all the wrong reasons. In 2005, there was the Aquarius launch vehicle, which would have been a big, dumb SSTO. Yay? Uh, since then, I've only heard of two new designs. The uh, Russian oop, Corona, which at this point is just CGI and nothing else, and a rumored Ariane Ultimate for the 2040s. What's that? There's, there's another one? Dang it! Okay, so just a few days ago, another SSTO was revealed. It's a space plane launched on a magnetic track. Gary Hudson's building the engine. Uh, that's all we really know. That's all I really care about. And please, spare me your Kerbal SSTO designs. 
it works in Kerbal Space Program is not a real argument. Dang it. Let me know your thoughts on SSTOs in the comments below. <sighs>